Uh, I'm Michael Ray. I'm the director of the Center for Philosophy Provision, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce today the Alvin Plantinga Lecture, given by the holder of the Alvin Plantinga Fellowship uh, in the Center for Philosophy Provision, Professor John Hare. As faculty honor code officer on campus, I feel like I'm also obliged to confess that the biography I'm about to read I have liberally plagiarized from an online, uh, or his Gifford Lectures biography, which is posted online, as my students often say in their trials on campus. They just put it so nicely. Professor Hare is the son of British utilitarian philosopher and Oxford professor R.M. Hare. He is a classicist and ethicist, and he is currently the Noah Porter Professor of Philosophical Theology at Yale Divinity School. Prior to teaching at Yale, he taught at Calvin College and at Lehigh University. He's been a Congressional Fellow of the American Philosophical Association and Staff Associate for the House Foreign Affairs Committee of the United States House of Representatives. This is his second time holding the senior fellowship here at the Center for Philosophy and Religion. Among his many writings are the books Why Bother Being Good, God's Call, The Moral Gap, Ethics and International Affairs, co authored with Terry B. Joint, and Plato's Youth of Rome. He didn't write the Youth of Rome, Plato's Youth of Rome. He wrote a book called Plato's Youth of Rome. He has also written numerous articles, book reviews, and papers. He gave the Gifford Lectures. Uh, in 2005, and he has also been the Calvin Lecturer and the Staub Lecturer. In 1997, he was the recipient of the Institute for Advanced Studies, Advanced Christian Studies Book Prize. We're honored to have him here with us, um, so please give a warm welcome to Professor John here. Thank you very much. This talk is about the current state of play in the philosophical discussion of the divine command theory of moral obligation. Roughly, the theory that what makes something morally obligatory is that God commands it. I'm going to do two things in this paper. First, contrast divine command theory with some forms of natural law theory and then relate this distinction to some contemporary work in evolutionary psychology. Within analytic philosophy, there has been a remarkable renewal of this discussion of divine command theory, starting with Philip Quinn's book, Divine Commands and Moral Requirements, in 1978. Before that book, there were various references to divine command theory, as an example of what happens when ethical theory goes wrong. I could give you references from G. E. Moore, A. J. Eyre, and R. M. Hare, for example. But there was no sustained working out of a defensible form of the theory. There are also, in the analytic tradition, frequent references to two classical treatments that are supposed to have shown that divine command theory must be wrong. The first standard reference is to Plato's Euthyphro and Socrates' view that what is holy is loved by the gods because it is holy and not vice versa. This is the arbitrariness worry about divine command theory that just anything would be obligatory if God commanded it. Now, I'm not going to say much about this except that if we separate between a theory of the obligatory and of the good, we can say that God's having discretion about what to command is consistent with God having a reason to command, namely, that what commands is for our good because it fits what we are like, although it is not deducible from it. The other historical text that is often said to have shown that divine command theory is wrong is a text from Kant's Groundwork, where Kant rejects, I quote, the theological concept which derives morality from a divine and supremely perfect will, close quotes. This is the heteronomy worry about divine command theory, and again, I'm not going to say much about this except that I take Kant to be arguing that morality itself requires us to take our duties as imposed upon us by the king of the kingdom of ends, and that only if we do so will our commitment to the moral life be rationally stable. We can talk about that 
if you want afterwards. It's another talk. The discussion that Philip Quinn began has been sustained, and I'll skip out the list that I gave you in the text. What I want to ask about this discussion is, who is the opponent? Who are the divine command theorists arguing against? The answer is, in part, people who want to leave God out of ethical theory completely. But that is not going to be my focus. These divine command theorists have another set of opponents in mind, opponents who are within the class of theists. In the case of Robert Adams, for example, probably the most distinguished book in this tradition, he says that he finds natural law theory unappealing. Natural law theory and divine command theory are usually taken as the two main competitors within theism for an account of the relation between our moral obligation and God. But the nature of this competition is, upon examination, very obscure. I'm going to try to make it less obscure. But this is a large project, and one that will take me some years. Part of my project for this year at Notre Dame is that Jean Porter and I have agreed that we will meet regularly and read each other's work and see if, when we have made the necessary qualification to each other, there are still areas of important disagreement between us. I think this is a good procedure. The terms divine command theory and natural law theory are vague. They have been and continue to be many different varieties of each. This is a quite general point in philosophy. Arguments about whether, let's say, deontology can be reconciled with virtue theory are beset with the vagueness of the original terms. We are much better off asking, can Aristotle's view be reconciled with Kant's? Then we can be held accountable to the original texts. Very likely, in this kind of argument, the answer will be no. The two positions contradict each other. But we can then proceed by modification. If we change Aristotle's views in respects ABC, and we change Kant's views in respects DEF, then we may get a consistent view. It will not be a helpful question at this point. Is this view that we have now developed really a deontological view any longer, or is it really a virtue theory? This will be like the question, was England the same country after 1066? Which was, I remind you, the date of the Norman Conquest. The answer is, well, it was the same country in some respects, and not the same country in other respects. Or better, that's not a very good question. In my case, I'm starting with Duns Scotus. And I will take him to be a divine command theorist, although Richard Cross disagrees with me. I hate disagreeing with Richard Cross because he knows Scotus much better than I do. But in this case, I will persevere. Cross thinks Scotus is not a divine command theorist because divine command theory holds at least that divine commands are necessary for moral obligation. But Scotus says, I quote, that the moral goodness of the act consists mainly in its conformity with right reason, which dictates fully just how all the circumstances should be that surround the act, close quote. And in another place, that from those circumstances of the action, I quote, one immediately concludes that such an action ought to be performed by this agent for such an end, close quote. Cross takes it that these passages show that Scotus is not a divine command theorist because our right reason is sufficient for determining the moral goodness of an act or that it should be performed, and therefore God's command is not necessary. There are a number of difficulties here. One is that Scotus does not make the distinction I am making between a theory of the good and a theory of the right or of obligation. I am not trying to defend a divine command theory of the good. My suggestion worked out elsewhere is that the good is what draws us and deserves to draw us. And that what finally deserves to draw us is God and our union with God. 
In Scotus's language, our end is to be co-lovers, he says, condiligentes, with God. But there are multiple things that are good in the sense of drawing us and deserving to draw us that are not obligatory. Everything that is obligatory is good, but not everything that is good is obligatory. A divine command theorist will say that what makes a good thing obligatory is that God commands it. Once this distinction between the good and the obligatory has been made, the possibility emerges of separating our forms of access to the two. We also will have to distinguish in both cases between our knowledge of something good or obligatory and our knowledge of what makes it good or obligatory. It is possible that what makes something good or obligatory is some relation to God, different in the two cases. But that we can know it is good or obligatory without knowing this relation. Perhaps God reveals to our reason the commanded route, I say route, you say route, to our end, without revealing that the divine will has so chosen it. Since we can suppose that God has prescribed for us a route to our final end, that is in perfect harmony with our nature, we can expect to see this harmony by means of our reason. We can see that when we tell the truth, respect each other's lives, honor our parents, and so on, we progress toward the life that we are made for, the life of being co-lovers with God. But Scotus insists that what we see is a harmony, or a beauty, or a fittingness, and not an entailment of the commands from our nature. So skipping two sentences. So we can make two claims together. First, that we can know moral goodness by reason, since it fulfills our nature. And second, that what makes something obligatory is that God has prescribed it to us, as opposed to other fitting routes that God could also have prescribed. Whatever fulfills our nature and takes us towards our final end is good, we might say, but only what God chooses from all these good things is obligatory. In these terms, we can have access by reason to what is good, but it is not conformity to our reason that makes something good, but rather that it draws us to our end. And it is not conformity to our reason that makes something obligatory, but rather that God commands it.